Awesome. We have been talking about uh, the Word of God for, this is our eighth week on a series called 40 Days in the Word. So you do the math, we little, went a little overtime on this one, but it's been really good. It's been really good just to really focus on the Word of God and, and the power of the Word of God in our lives. And so uh, our challenges have been to develop a lifelong habit of reading the Bible every day, of like giving God some space in your life every day to grow, to learn, to rely on, on Him and His wisdom, and also to memorize a verse a week. So how many of you are on the Word team, the memorizing team, and you've been doing this? And uh, yeah, that's awesome. We have like 100, over 170 people that have committed to memorize a, a verse a week. And so this week's verse is a great one. It's easy. We talked about it a couple weeks ago. It's Psalm 119. 105. So let's, let's try it together. Let's read this out loud. Okay, ready? Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light for my path. And we talked about this verse a couple weeks ago. Like uh, if you're ever camping or you're out in the woods or it's dark out or you are uh, you know need to get somewhere and you can't see, when you turn a flashlight on, for instance, it shows you your next couple of steps, right? One or two steps or so. But you can't see the whole thing. And I, I believe that that's a, a good analogy for our walk with God. Because it, I think, it's just my personal opinion, if I knew everything that I was going to go through, I would probably just sit down and suck my thumb and start crying or something, you know. But God gives us the strength one day at a time, one step at a time, to go on a journey with him. And he wants you to go on a journey with him. He doesn't want you to just do this God thing and check the box and set him aside and then good luck and try to live your life. He wants you to walk with him. And I think that's the idea of this verse is that God's word will daily guide us, moment by moment, enlighten the steps that we are to take, right? And we take that step of faith one step at a time. And God's word is what will guide you in life. So can we get a big amen on that one? So we want God's word to be our flashlight. We want to use God's word for every situation. Well, uh, I've got a jar of hot water up here, and I'm going to start this analogy right now because I hope to enjoy it throughout my message. How many of you like hot tea? Anybody like hot tea? So this analogy here for you is, is similar to um, the, the message today about the idea of how to integrate God's word into your life. <clears throat> and I think about the word integrate, and it's opposite from the word segregate, right? Segregate means to uh, divide things apart, to have things separated. Like if you have a segregated life, then you have my job life, my family life, my church life. If you're a student, it's school over here, church over there, maybe sports here, my video gaming buddies over here. And everything's split up into these different categories. But God's word, what we want to see from this analogy is that that God's word, we want to be saturated in God's word. We won't just want a little, whoops, sorry, Gene, wherever you are, uh, a little, little dip. You know, you can see a little color in there, but at, fortunately, this is brown up here, so I'm sure it'll match, but I hope. Uh, so we don't want to just dip in, in the word once in a while. We don't want to just go to church and that's all we do, um, and then live the rest of our life doing stuff however we think we can do. We, the Bible says we want to be completely saturated, saturated. We want the Word of God to saturate every area of our lives, okay? So the word integrate comes from, uh, and by the way, I was drinking the tea after the first service. It was really weak, so I'm going to add some more power to it. <laughs> so let me get some more in here. But when we, when we think about the word integrate, it comes from the same root word that the word integrity comes from. And if you know about integrity, uh, you may say, oh, yeah, integrity, that's that word where I'm supposed to be a good person or... Well, no, it's not, that's not what it means. It means that you're whole. It means that there's no pieces missing. It means that you're the same person at school as you are at church, as you are on vacation, as you are at home, as you are in your sports team, as you are in Las Vegas. Wherever you go and whoever you're around, integrity means you're the same whole person. Your life isn't broken into pieces like I act this way over here, but I'm going to act that way over there. That's segregated. But God wants your life to be integrated into his word. You know what I'm saying? So all of our life is to be um, influenced by the word of God. All of it. 
just like this is getting, it's starting to take on the flavor. Like at first, a hot glass of water, jar of water isn't very appealing to me, but um, this is getting to be more appealing to me because uh, the flavor now of these tea bags are soaking into this water. And, and it's taking on its color and its flavor and all that aroma. Mmm, how many of you want some tea now? Yeah, sorry. But what will make it a little bit better is a little sugar. So let me throw some sugar. Let me just throw some sugar in there. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. That's always fun to come up with an analogy that I can actually enjoy. Let me stir it up a little bit. You guys don't mind, do you? You guys got your cups of drinks out there. Come on. Whoops. This is going to get messy, but. Ah, yeah. That's good. All right. So the analogy is we want to be saturated in God's Word. And we, we, we don't want the Word of God to just influence us. Even, let's say that we, you're, just, you're just starting this whole idea of reading the Bible every day, which is awesome. But we don't want the Word of God just to influence us for, let's say, those 15 minutes a day or whatever it is, and just say, okay, oh, this is great. And then we walk away, and then we just live our life the way whatever we come up with. What the idea of the whole point of reading the Bible and honoring God with the Word of God and studying it and learning it and, and knowing all that is so that we can actually do what? We can live it, right? Because when we live it, when we walk it out, that's where all the blessings come from. And so today's message, I'm really kind of, kind of sort of wrapping up this series, but we're not wrapping up our devotion to the Word of God, Okay. So my question to you is, now as we're wrapping up this series, which we had a great series on the, on the Word of God, you know, what, how do I maintain a heart for God's Word? And how do I integrate God's Word into my life moving forward? Because whenever we switch to a new topic, we can't just turn our, 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 you know, Word of God switch off. This is something that we have been making a commitment to and establishing in our lives to last us a lifetime. Young people... Um, this is one of the greatest, most important decisions you can make in your life. The first one, as Caleb already said, is, was it Ashley? The, the greatest decision any person on planet Earth will ever make in their life is to declare Jesus as their Lord and Savior. Okay? That's the greatest decision. That's the gr most important decision of every single one of our lives because it doesn't just change the quality of our life here and now. It sets up our eternal destiny in God. It is a miracle. It's the greatest miracle that happens every day on planet Earth when a person gives their life to, to, to the Lord Jesus. That's the greatest miracle you'll ever see. It's greater than someone being healed, someone being raised from the dead, because this is eternal life. Jesus said you're literally crossing a line from death into eternal life with him. And so God wants you to experience that miracle in your life personally. Then he wants, to be, wants you to be a conduit of seeing that miracle happen through your testimony of God. It's the greatest thing that God will ever do in your life is to, to be a part, just a sliver, of someone else coming to know him like that. The second greatest decision you'll ever make in your, in your life, which is my opinion, is who you marry. It's a pretty big deal, pretty big decision. But I think that this is right up there, maybe number two, maybe number three. It's probably number two, now that I think about it. And that is you decide to put the word of God as the focal point for building your life. That if your life is here, and the Bible is here, that you adjust your life to the Bible. That would be probably the second greatest decision in your life. Right behind it would be who you marry. Okay. Because it affects every area of your life. There isn't any area of your life that you want to go rogue and do it your way and not follow God's way. I'm just telling you, you don't want to do that because it won't work. It won't work as well as God. Let me just shake some sugar off here so I can see my paper better. Okay, so anyway, as this series concludes, how do I maintain a heart for God? How do I become a man, after, a man of God's word or a woman of God's word? And Jesus put it this way in John 8, 31. And I'm, I'm quoting from the King James Version just because I, I like the word that's in there. And Jesus says, if ye continue, continue in my word. The NIV, I think, says, if you hold to my teaching. And Jesus says, if you will continue in my word, if you hold to my teaching, if you will remain in my word, if you will abide in my word, uh, then you are truly my disciples. And the second verse is this, and then you'll know the truth, right? And the truth will set you free. It will transform your life. 
if you hold to, if you continue in the Word of God. It's not just hearing it. It's doing it, holding to it, putting it into practice. Then it will change your life. The power of God's Word. And so I want to do something kind of uh, fun with you, and that is review this series by picking out some of the memory verses that we've been memorizing as our main points and to give us an overall kind of guideline of how do we maintain this passion for God's Word and how do I become a man of God's Word or a woman of God's Word, okay? I hope that that's what you want because if you know anything at all about God's Word, the purpose of His Word, it's to bring life and fullness and peace and joy into your life. And so it would be, uh, if you're a chocolate addict like, like, like me, maybe, um, Easter's coming up and we get chocolate bunnies, <laughs> you know? And someone says, you can have all the chocolate you want. You're like, give it to me. This is like, you can have all the life that you want. Give it to me. Let's, let's figure out how to get it. And the, the biggest difference for me uh, when I think about, about this is, uh, you know, the Bible talks about things like peace. It says, hey, you can have peace. You don't have to live in worry. You don't have to live under stress. You don't have to live... Uh, Freak, freaking out all the time. It says that you can have peace. So how in the world do I get that from the pages off of this book? How do I get that promise into my life in such a way that I'm actually experiencing that peace? Right? Do you hear what I'm saying? Because it's not just reading about it. Oh, it's so wonderful that there's this great God that, wish, that says that I can have peace, but I don't have it. So where's the gap? How do I get from what it's saying to how do I experience it? That's what Jesus is saying. He's like, listen to me. If you hold on to my teachings, if you put them into practice, if you actually step them out one, one step at a time, you shine the light, that's what the Bible says to do. It's a lamp to my path, my feet, you know. Okay, I'm going to do it, and I'm going to do that. And all of a sudden, what starts to happen is you begin to experience that peace. That's what the Bible says. Don't be anxious about anything. Right, But in all things, with prayer and thanksgiving, make your request made known to God, and the peace of God will guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. You can say, wow, that's such a wonderful promise, and stop there. Or you can say, wow, that's such a wonderful promise. Okay, let me do it. Okay, here's my, here's my freak out moment. Here's my freaking out issue. Here's my worry. Here it is, God. This is it. Okay, it says uh, uh, to give it to you. Okay, you take this problem, and I'm going to thank you, says Thanksgiving. Okay, I'm going to thank you that you're smarter than I am, that you can take this problem. You can solve it. You can, ha- you can help me figure out how to do it. So I'm going to give it to you. I'm thanking you. I'm giving it to you. And now I receive your peace. And you actually do those things, and you start walking it out, and all of a sudden you start to experience peace. Right? You see what I'm saying? All right, so that's what we want. That's what we want. Okay, so I want to talk about six steps to becoming a man of the word or a woman of the word. And these mostly are review, but I'm going to draw a picture. You guys like pictures? All right, I'm going to go to art class, go all the way back to seventh grade, see if I can conjure up some artistic ability here. Yeah. First one I want to say, though, is the first point. I must build my life on the word of God. I like to play around with construction stuff once in a while. And I mentioned this at the outset of this series, that it's like every time we have a promise in God's word, every time there's a verse that speaks to your heart, it's like a two by four. You take it and you put it in the foundation and you solidify that in your life and one board at a time, one verse at a time, one principle at a time, you are building your foundation on the rock, and the verse that we memorized this week from, from last week's message was Matthew 7, uh, 24. And Jesus summarized the whole point of his story about the wise man and the foolish man. And he said it this way. It says, everyone who hears these words of mine and does what? Puts them into practice. He's like a wise man who built his house on a rock. And now the whole point of this is Jesus saying, build your life on my teaching. You will be like a house that goes through the same storms everybody else goes through, but instead of coming crashing down, even though you go through a storm because you're with me and you built your your life on my principles, you will stand. You will stand. 
you'll make it. And eventually you will be prosperous and successful if you build your life on the Word of God. Okay? So the first thing we got to do is build our life on the Word of God. We don't want to build it on these four things, popular culture. We don't want to say, well, everybody else is doing it this way. This is what's cool. This is what's popular. But that's always changing. So we don't build our life on what everybody else is doing. That's not smart. The Bible says in Exodus 23, 2, don't follow the crowd in doing wrong. The second thing we don't want to build on is tradition. Traditions are good, but they oftentimes get to an extinction point where they're obsolete or they don't work anymore. Even, even Jesus said this to some of his listeners. He said to them in Mark 7, 8, you've let go of the commands of God, and now you're holding on to the traditions of men. Even in the church, we can do things, and, and it can be traditional, and we lose the real essence or the meaning of what we're doing. Have you ever been in a, a church service or in a, in a service at some point, and we just, why, why are we doing that? Oh, just because we always do that. Uh, I grew up in a church where You know, we didn't have a lot of instruments, just a a few. Uh, And that was just, you know, there's a time in our culture about 20 years ago where there's some changing going on in the music styles and people are getting contemporary and all of a sudden someone's playing electric guitar in church and some people are like, we can't play electric guitars in church. Why? Because we've never done that before. It's not what we do, you know. Or we always sing out of this book. And sometimes traditions kind of get outdated and whatnot. This is not tradition, This is eternal truth. This is eternal truth, right? God's truth doesn't change. But some of the other things that we we experience do change. But what won't change is the significance or the meaning, for example, of communion. We do communion every week. We don't do it because that's what we do. We do it because we have faith that when we exercise our faith in communion, that we can be healed, that we can be forgiven, you know, that we can be set free that there's power in recognizing what Jesus did at the cross for each and every one of us, right? So we're always talking about it because we don't ever want it to become an empty tradition. But we build our life on the word of God, not just traditions. We don't just say, well, that's just the way we always do it because that's the way my family does it. If it doesn't align with the word of God, then it's time for a change, okay? It's time for a change. Another thing that we don't want to build our, our life on is reason because we're not always right, the Bible says it this way in Proverbs 16, 25. There's a way that seems right to man, but in the end, it leads to death. Have you ever been convinced of something later to find out you're totally wrong? So we can't just interpret our world and just figure it all out in our mind and build our life on our intellect, on our reasoning, on our smarts, on our opinion, uh, because God says your way is not right. It's not always right. Unless it aligns with my way, it's not right. My way is right, okay? And finally, emotions. How many of you know emotions can lie to us? How many many of you are glad you didn't marry the first person you had a crush on? (laughs) Just saying, just saying. All right. This is the one. She's the one. He's the one. Not really. All right. So emotion, it, some people live that way. They say, well, if it feels right, then I'll do it. If it doesn't feel right, I don't do it. But how many of you, uh, you know, go to work that way? I don't feel like going to work today. You think that's going to work out in the real world very long? No. I mean, it just doesn't work that way. Um, so our feelings don't always uh, help us. Uh, they don't always tell us the truth. They're not a good uh, thing to build your life on. So do, we don't always want to do what we feel like doing. Sometimes that will get us into big trouble Uh, because our feelings aren't always right. But the Word of God is right. The the message here in Judges 21, 25 said there's a time in the Bible in this this book, the Judges, where it says at that time there was no king over Israel and everybody did whatever they felt like doing. And if you read that book, you'll find out they got into a lot of trouble. Nobody had a real clear vision for their life and there's some really crazy things that went on. Uh, because there was, there was, uh, they were just doing whatever they felt like doing. Okay, so the first point is we must, I must build my life on the Word of God, okay? Second one is I need to feed on the Word of God. And Colossians 3.16 is one of those verses we memorized where it says, let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly. It reminds me of my tea here. Let it soak into your being. Let it be not just a little dip, but let it, Dwell in you richly, like 
thickly, like a lot. Let it take over. Let it consume you. Let it permeate your life. Let the Word of God dwell in you richly. The Word of Christ, okay? And so we need to feed on, on the Word of God. Now, we all feed on physical food all the time, right? Some of us more than others. By the way, just for the record, I eat as much as I can all the time. It's just, I just, it just burns up because I'm always running or doing something. I don't know. But I like to eat too. I eat as much as I can. So, you know, we do that and it builds us up, right? It gives us energy. And if we go without eating for a while and, uh, and we, we try to do something, we can feel weak. If you've ever uh, not eaten for a day or two, maybe because of medical reasons or maybe because you did a fast or something, you know how quickly within a, a day or two, all of a sudden you can start getting lightheaded or dizzy or headaches or weak. And, uh, and the Bible says of itself, it's water, it's milk, it's bread, it's meat. It's our spiritual food. It's what makes us spiritually strong. We have to feed on the word of God, okay? How many of you know that we are in a spiritual war, right? Would you ever go into a physical war uh, without eating, with being weak and tired? Of course not, because you would you'd just get pummeled, right? Especially if it's like a hand-to-hand, if you think about a wrestling match or a boxing match or you're, you're, you're something like that. You've got to have your strength with you. But we live in a spiritual war. The, the, what gives you strength is the Word of God. We are reminded of that when we see Jesus in a confrontation with the devil, right, in the desert. And, and Jesus wasn't actually wrestling the devil. I don't think the devil actually showed up physically. I think it was thoughts, just like you and I have thoughts all the time, that's trying to tear us down or, or attack us. And Jesus, in his weak state, because he was physically weak, but he wasn't spiritually weak. He was fasting in the desert for 40 days. And the Bible says the devil came to tempt him. And he was whispering thoughts to him. And what did he do? He said out loud the word of God, right? He spoke out loud the word of God. This is our strength. This is our weapon. This is how we fight the wrong thoughts, is to know the right thoughts, They say, I don't know, I've never verified this, but I've heard this many times. They say the people, who, whoever the people are who can see counterfeit money, they can see it because they study the real thing so much. They don't study counterfeit, they study the real thing. So that anything that comes by immediately doesn't look right. Something's not right. I don't know exactly what it is, but something's not right because they've studied the real thing. That's what this is to you. Study the real thing and you'll know what's not right as soon as it comes across. You might not know exactly verse or chapter or whatever, but you'll just know in your spirit. That's not lining up. I know there's something not right here because I know the real thing. You hear what I'm saying? And so we need to feed feed on the Word of God. And uh, here's some of the things that we do to feed on the Word of God. We receive it with our ears, right? You're listening to it right now. So I want to challenge you to continue to commit to coming to church to hear the Word of God, to hear the Word of God. When you're reading the Bible on your own, it would be a good idea at times to read it out loud because now not only are your eyes, you know, reading it and your brain is engaged in what you're seeing with your eyes, but you're also hearing it. The Bible says we get faith from hearing the Word of God. I don't know why, but that's what it says. It says faith comes from hearing the message of Christ, hearing about who God is, hearing it. So it's very important that we're hearing the word of God. So keep coming to church. This is part of your your plan to be who God's called you to be, okay? We read it with our eyes. So I'm I'm challenging you to read the Bible with your eyes every day, every day. Read the Bible. If you skip a day, something happens, you're busy, something happens, you forget, whatever. Don't don't beat yourself up. Just Just do it the next day. You know, because you missed one meal, doesn't mean you give up on eating. Some of us make up for it. <laughs> oh, man, I haven't eaten all day. Get out of the way, baby. Oh, yeah. I'm going to make up for that lost meal. We keep track. Now, in spiritual food, it's very important that we keep feeding. So we feed with our ears, with our eyes, and with our hands and our mouth. The Bible says we are to speak God's word, and we can study God's word. And the difference between reading and studying is studying as you get a pen or pencil out. 
you have a notebook or a journal, and you're reading it, and you're writing down what God's saying to you, or a verse that speaks to you. Maybe you don't even know exactly what it's speaking to you, but there's something in there that's touching your heart, and you're just like, I've got to just kind of write that down. God, what are you saying to me? And now you're engaging in it, and what's happening is your brain is being engaged even more at a deeper level, and your retention of what God is saying to you is going up, 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 okay? When you hear it, 5% retention. When you see it, 10%. When you write it down and talk about it, 50%. But if you take what you are learning and you tell someone else and you teach it to someone else, and every teacher here knows this, every coach knows this, if you ever take something that you've learned and you teach it to somebody else, you retain 95% of what you're teaching. Now, it's not about stuffing stuff in here. It's about walking it out here, walking it out here. So I have this great perk in my position here as pastor that I get to teach all the time. So I got a 95% perk. Isn't that nice? In my profession, because I get to teach what God is teaching me. And, uh, and it's, it's a great blessing in my life to be able to, to share with you. And that's one of the reasons why I would encourage all of us to get connected to a life group where we get to talk about our lives and talk about what God is doing in our lives and share what we're learning and listen to other people because we grow best when we're together. We do. Even if you're not a big relationship person, we grow best, we learn more when we're around other people and we're on this faith journey together. So I'd really encourage you to try to get connected to a life group. Uh, And then, of course, we reflect on the Word of God with our minds and we remember it with our heart. That's why we're meditating and memorizing God's Word. Okay, the third point I want to make is not only do I build my life on God's Word and feed on God's Word, but I decide to live by God's Word. I live by it. That's the standard for my decisions. You know, when Amy and I got married, we agreed that uh, we didn't know what was going to come into our future, but we agreed that the Bible was going to be our standard. And so we were, whatever issues would come up or we, would, we just said, what, you know, whatever the Bible says, that's what we're going to do. We decided that together. So, you know, with our giving, that's decided by what the Bible teaches us about giving. As much as possible with our parenting, you know, we try to figure out what does God say and how do we parent our kids according to, you know, according to the Bible. We're not perfect, but at least we have an anchor. It's, it's something that pulls us back, right? If you're on the anchor, depending on what, what way the, the wind is blowing, you might drift a little bit here and there, but it keeps you, keeps you anchored, right? And, and our anchor is the Bible. If the Bible says something, then that's where we are moving towards, we're moving towards the anchor. It's holding our ground. And we might drift here and there a little bit from time to time, but not on purpose, but, you know, we all, we all make mistakes. We all have little attitudes at times and stuff like that, but we come back to the anchor. That's, that's what we decide. We're going to live according to the Word of God because we believe that God's Word is true, and it's perfect, and it's eternal, and it's blessing. And Psalm 1 says this, that if you follow God and you meditate on his, on his word day and night, that you will be prosperous and successful. So I want to read to you this psalm. Uh, it's an awesome psalm to maybe meditate on and memorize from time to time, okay? It says, Blessed is the man or woman who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked or stand in the way of sinners or sit in the seat of mockers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree, or she's like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season, and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever he does, prospers. Whatever she does, prospers. How many of you want to have a prosperous, fruitful life? Okay, now, we only believe the parts of the Bible that we do. Okay, I know it's a harsh statement to make, but we only believe the parts of the Bible that we actually do, and so... The Bible says that if you want to be prosperous and successful, become a person who is meditating and filling your mind day and night with God's Word. If you're not filling your mind with God's Word day and night, if you're not focused on growing in that capacity, it might be because you don't believe that it actually will cause you to be prosperous and successful or that you've never heard that promise before. So today I want to fuel that promise in you a little bit. As we close the series, we're not closing our pursuit of God's Word to be preeminent in our life, right? 
That's number one in our life. We want God's word to be at the forefront of all we do. And there's a story that Jesus tells in, uh, in Luke chapter eight, and it's about the sower sowing seed. And the seed is the word of God. And Jesus says, here's the, the, uh, the key to getting fruitfulness out of the word of God, okay? He says, first of all, there's four different types of soils in this story. One is the hard path, and it's like a hard heart. It's a person that's um, not receptive to God. Maybe there's pride, arrogance, or maybe there's anger towards God, and the seed is cast out, and it bounces and never goes into the soil, okay? And that's a hard heart. And what happens is Jesus tells a story how the birds of the air come and just swallow up the seed, and there's no fruit whatsoever. The word of God just bounces off the heart. And he says, the enemy just steals that from you. So none of us want a hard heart. And now, this isn't a permanent situation. This could be tomorrow you could wake up and have a hard heart. And God wants to speak to you, and he's like, I'm just, I'm just whatever. Or you could be here this morning, and there could be any one of us could have any of these conditions. Uh, and later today, it could be changing, depending on how we're, our attitudes are, you know. But the second type of soil that the Bible talks about in this story is shallow soil. And it says here that the, uh, the, I'm trying to find it, those on the rocky soil or shallow soil are those who, when they hear and receive the word with joy, they have no root. They believe for a while, and in a time of temptation, they fall away. In other words, uh, it's a superficial approach to our Christianity. It's very shallow soil. There's no roots that go down to hold that seed for the plant to grow long enough to produce fruit. So it's kind of like this. Oh, I like, yeah, this is a great point, Pastor. Oh, you, you sang, sang a song, and you're like, something moves upon you, and you're like, oh, wow, that's really a great thought. But you just, you're, you're preoccupied with other things, and you don't hold on to that thought or that word that God was just speaking to your heart, and you just go on to something else, and later today you completely forget about it. Or, or, you, you would have a different approach, and you're like, whoa, God is speaking to me. And you, you latch on to that thought, and you say, I'm going to invest some time into letting God really speak that into my heart. And I'm going to think about that song a little bit more, or that verse a little bit more, and later today I'm going to process that. And you begin to nurture it, and it begins to grow, and it begins to get some roots, and all of a sudden it begins to change your attitude. This morning while we're singing a song, God spoke something to me. And it wasn't like, hey, Tim, you know, this is God. I am now speaking to you. Listen up. You know, it's just something that moved across my heart. We're singing a song, reckless love, that reckless love phrase. And I was thinking, this is just this is me just telling you what I was just experiencing. And God showed me that sometimes I think that I could run out of love for people. Like I, I could be like, oh, I have how much more do I, can I give? And all of a sudden he just spoke to me and he says, you will never run out of love because I never run out of love. My love is reckless. If you, if you had so much stuff, so much money or whatever it is, you could be reckless with it because you would have no fear you're ever going to run out, right? God is so full of love, he just pours it out recklessly without any concern about ever running out or, or what, you know, he just loves. And so he was showing me, you can just love, Tim, you can just love people because I'll never run out of love. You'll never run out of love if you're depending on my love. And you can love lavishly, recklessly. Come on, man. So I was like, oh. So I got to hold on to that thought today, and I got to process that. And I, by t speaking it to you now, I'm going to remember it. Ha, <laughs> tricked you. <laughs> tricked you into helping me out. Thank you. Thank you. Now, you got to do the same thing. We have thoughts all the time. How many of you have already had something that just moved upon you today in a song or in a, a, a verse or something? It was just a thought like, oh, just a little, oh, hmm. Anybody? So here's what you do with that. Hold on to that. Jesus said, you hold on to my word. You continue in my word. You abide and remain in that word that I'm speaking to you. Then you will truly be my disciples. And then you're going to know the truth that God is trying to share with you and it will change your life. One board at a time, right? One two by four at a time. So don't be superficial. Don't be like, oh, something felt good today. 
you know, oh, there, there's a song, something, I don't know, but it, it just felt good. I want to go there again because I want to feel good. Don't do that. You can feel good all the time if you hold on to that and let it grow. If you don't nurture it and, dis- and discipline yourself to let that thing grow, it'll, it'll dissipate. You'll, you'll forget it, okay? And then there, there's the soil with weeds, and this is where I want to finish my message on, and here goes the picture. So the soil with weeds is um, the idea that thorns and weeds grow up alongside of the, the word, and it begins to choke out the life of the plant. And because it takes over, and before the plant can actually give blossom to the tomato or whatever the fruit might be, it gets choked out, and it's, have you ever heard of a sucker plant? sucks all the other nutrients around it and just takes the life right out of the plant. The plant can be big and beautiful and have all these vines, but there's no fruit. And you could, you could know this promise about peace and you could do almost everything right and then there's no peace. And it's really frustrating to live that way. But the Bible says, Jesus said this way, here's what happens is the, the, the thorns and the weeds that are growing up, there's three main things that he points out to us to be aware of. That we need a garden We need to protect against these weeds. We need to pull these weeds out and these thorns out. Number one is the worries and the pressures of this life. How many of you have lost hours or days because of a problem or a pressure or a situation or a worry, and it just comes upon you, and all of a sudden it just kind of like paralyzes you, and now you're caught up in worrying, thinking, can't sleep, worrying about that, right? It's choking out something else that God wants for you to be focused on. That's what it's doing. I've been there too. The other one is the, the deceitfulness of pursuing wealth. We look around our world and we always want more, better, bigger, faster, prettier, whatever. And, and our whole world is, is built on that capitalism, consumerism. You know, there's always more out there and you'll be a lot happier if you can get it. And, and so the, Jesus says it's a, dis, it's a lie to be pursuing things because if you pursue God, this is the irony, irony of the seek first verse that you guys were focused on this weekend as youth. If you seek God, you get it all. If you seek the all, you don't even get all that, and you miss God. Because when you find God, you find everything that your heart really wants, love, and peace, and purpose, and joy. And when we chase the things, we end up, you know, empty and uh, discouraged and disappointed and disillusioned because it didn't give us what it promised us. You with me? The third thing that Jesus says, it's the worries of this world, it's the deceitfulness of wealth, and it's, the, it's just chasing after other things, being distracted, thinking that other things are what we're missing. I want to finish just by showing you a picture of, this is my picture of a brain, okay, with the brain stem, something like this. And this is my brain. It's not my brain. It's your brain because you're reading it. Gotcha. Okay. So that's your brain. And basically, this is what's going on in our world. I like to summarize this battle or this big Russell uh, competition with God's word versus the world's word. Okay? God's word versus the world's word. Jesus is saying in this parable, if you don't protect God's word and you're getting consumed with the worries of this world, the pursuit of wealth, or the pursuit of other things, this perspective and this uh, pursuit will choke out what God was trying to do in your life and in your heart. And it's very, this is where, where, where we live, okay? This is a real world Where we live, this is where we live. My friends have a huge impact on my values and my thoughts, and uh, it's just where we live. So choose your friends wisely, okay? We there's a a couple of people in the first service, and I'm I didn't know the one lady very well. I'm looking at her, and I'm looking at her friend. I'm like, you guys, I said, you're sisters, right? No, we're best friends. I'm like, you guys look exactly alike. And the one said, well, yeah, we've been forming into each other for the last 10 years, you know. And that's what happens. You become like your friends, right? You agree with me? Books that we read, the books that we read uh, affect our thoughts and the friends that we hang around with. Those are the two biggest influential factors 
on who you are today, why you believe what you believe, what you weigh what you weigh right now, what you're involved in, what activities you do. It's because of the friends that you, you hang out with and the books that you read. So let's start reading the book, the book, okay, because all these other things are going to impact our brain. Other things that we, we see as big influencers, I would say would be like teachers, coaches, professors, people that um, have this in our brain when we are listening to, uh, is that two Fs or one? Whatever. When we are listening to people of authority, a coach, a teacher, a, a parent, um, or a professor, our brain automatically is assigning to them an authority of of uh, credibility. And, and the problem is, if we have good teachers, coaches, and professors, that's, that's good. But if, if they're teaching the wrong things, that's bad. And we're believing things that we're not even aware of. My daughter came home one day. I told this story before, but I love the story. Do you mind if I tell this story? Yeah. All right, thank you. I used to get in trouble, so I thought I'd ask permission first. <laughs> So she comes home. She's real little. I don't remember what grade you're in. Do you remember? Second or first grade. And she came home, and she's <laughs> she said she was really little. Don't judge her. Okay. So um, and she comes home from school, and she's like, Daddy, my, my teacher has a frog in her throat. And, you know, we're, me and my wife, we laugh, and we're like, yeah, that's, you know, that's kind of funny. We're like, well, she doesn't actually have a frog in her throat. She's like, no, she has a frog in her throat. And we could not convince her otherwise, like, that's just a saying, you know, she just has a little, you know, sore throat. She couldn't, she couldn't make the distinction because she was told by her teacher, and her teacher knows the truth. Now, when you're little, and you have a mom, and you have a dad, or a grandma, or a grandpa, aunt, or uncle, teacher, whatever, and they're telling you things, or they're showing you things, or they're living a certain example in front of you, you may not be aware of this, but you are already assigning to them a level of credibility and truth, and you're absorbing those behaviors, those values, those beliefs. And if they were wrong, now you got some work to do. As an adult, you have to be transformed. So what do you want to be transformed into? You want to be transformed into God's Word. Why? Because that will bring freedom to you, life to you, right? Prosperity to you. This is the truth. There's parts of this that might have been true, parts of that might have been true, but if all of this stuff that we're going to put on this board is overwhelming uh, the word that God is speaking over your life, then um, you're going to lose the battle because this needs to be the one that's getting the focus right here. The word of God. If we're feeding our brain all this stuff, and by the way, I just mentioned it, family, you can't choose them. Can't choose your family, but you can, you can let God transform you from the things in your family that weren't healthy or correct, and you need to. Uh, but this is a huge influencer in your life. I got to go here, and all the youth here probably don't want me to say this, but the TV and the movies and the social media and the music and all of this stuff that we are putting into our brain, if it's not godly, it is affecting us. And all of this stuff coming from the world, all of these different things can choke out the Word of God. So if you want the Word of God to produce fruit in your life, you have to have something called discipline. You have to. And you can tell your brain what to think about. You're not, uh, you know, a robot. You're not, uh, you know, you have control. You can decide what you're going to think about. You can decide what this looks like, right? Right? You can decide who these people are. Can't decide those. You can decide the books that you read. You can evaluate what you are being taught according to God's principles and reject what's wrong and receive what's, what's correct. And if you don't do that, and if you're just, just going to say, ah, it'll all work out in the end, it won't work out in the end because you are already in a culture that is fallen and predominantly against the truth. And these factors here that are affecting us, if we don't purpose to build the word, our life on the word, we will be caught up in the current of a fallen culture. Absolutely no contest, knockout. 
It's a knockout. There's no question about it. We talk about this all the time. We just look around the world and see the chaos around us. And so if you want to be a man of the Word of God, you want to be a woman of the Word of God, you need to think about these things here and whether or not you are letting the Word of God dwell in you richly or just occasionally visit a little dip of the tea bag, or are you being saturated with it? And so the challenge as we leave the series and keep moving forward into this discipline of knowing God's Word is to really live it out. Why talk about peace when you can actually experience it? Why talk about freedom when you can actually taste it? You can actually have freedom. You can actually have transformation. You can actually have joy. You can actually hear God speak to your voice. And so to do that, we have to, Jesus said this, you have to pull the weeds, that there's some weeds, that there's some thorns, that there's some distractions. It's very easy to get caught up in the pressures of this world. And it can happen in one day. We can move from hard soil to good soil to weedy soil to back to this soil. You know? And so the idea is learning how to be a disciple of Jesus Christ, right? A disciple has the word discipline in it. How do we discipline our lives in a way that we can be fully alive in him? And so uh, this morning, if you received a bulletin on your way in, inside of that is a half sheet of paper, and it's called, if you can pull that out, um, I'm looking for mine. I don't know what I did with mine. It's called the Word of God Covenant. I don't see mine. Probably my Bible. There it is. looks like this, the 40 days in the word covenant. And uh, there's something about um, our names. When we sign our names to something, in our brain, it does something more of a commitment. You know, to say to someone, yeah, 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 we'll get together. There's a loose, there's a loose comment there that floats around, but it didn't, you didn't really nail yourself down. But when you sign your name to something, you're saying, I'm doing this. When I was a young person, uh, my youth pastor challenged me to live a life of purity until I got married. This is for a youth, a young person. This is one of the top five most important decisions you'll ever make in your life. Um, and so number one is Jesus. Number two is committing to the word of God. Number three is who you marry. But before you get to there, number three is living a life of purity. It's saving yourself for your future spouse. And so when he gave that challenge to me and a couple of my other friends, we, we, we decided to go for it. And we signed our name. And when we signed that name, that was like, we're making our decision. He said, you don't make your decision, you know, during a, the lights are low and you're watching a romantic movie, and then you're like, okay, what do I do? Uh, I already know what you're going to do. It's too late. If you haven't made your decision before, what do you think you're going to do? And so making decisions in life and then managing those decisions are super important for us. And to be a man of the word or a woman of the word, this is one of the top probably the second most important thing you can do because it will impact every decision that you make in your life. It will bring life into you. Do you see what I'm saying? And so I want to encourage you to consider doing this on your own. And this is just for you. You're not going to turn this in. You're not going to tell me. This is for you to say, I'm going to be a man of the word or a woman of the word. And so I want to read it through here with you. This verse says, all scriptures God breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the man or woman of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. God wants to equip you for everything, okay? And at the bottom it says, I commit to living a life transformed by God's word, by reading God's word daily, putting God's word into action, and memorizing God's word. This is a path of life for you. This is a path of prosperity and success for you. And I challenge you to be a man of the word and a woman of the word. So sign this on your own if you want to and begin to continue to put that into practice in your life and make that be your anchor, okay? So let's stand together as we close our service. In life, uh, there's only about a dozen major decisions that you make, that you should make. And then you spend the rest of your life managing those decisions. Like one of the decisions I, I've made in my financial life is to be debt-free, uh, outside of houses. And so the rest of my life, I've been managing that decision. And it's not easy. But I made a decision a long time ago, my wife and I together. And so we buy cars like Dave Smith. <laughs> we buy old cars. 
because we're managing a major decision we made a long time ago. And, uh, and, and, and so now committing to reading the Word of God, how do you manage that? You need to come up with a plan. You need to come up with a time and come up with a routine. And uh, for me, it's in the morning, first thing in the morning. That's what I do. Get my Bible. I've got a reading plan. I read my Bible. I spend time with God. And then hopefully that helps fuel my day, and I keep some of that going throughout the day. You see? And so that's what you make the decision, but then you manage it, and you let the life of God continue to flow in you. This morning, the most important decision anyone in here could make. If you're here this morning and you haven't made Jesus the Lord of your life, today's the day for you to get right with God. This is the most important decision for you because he came and he died for you to forgive you of your sins and to reunite you in a relationship with your heavenly father. And he's gone on before all of us to make a place in eternity for you and for me to be. We're we're of, of, of the heavenly destiny that we all look forward to. The Bible says that we can't even think or imagine what God has in store for us. We can't even think big enough, wide enough, great enough, joyful enough. We can't even imagine it. And so the future that you have in God is a great future. The best is yet to come for you. And if you're here today and you need to get right with God, I want to invite you to give your life to Jesus as Lord and Savior and and receive his forgiveness and begin this relationship with God. And uh, after I pray for for those who want to do that this morning, I just want to pray for all of us to have a hunger for God's word and and to just really establish uh, the word of God as an anchor in our lives that God will continue to be able to speak into our hearts every single day and that we will be men of, of the word, women of the word, okay? Would you bow your heads with me, please? I want to pray for those this morning. I want to get right with God. If that's you, say, Pastor, I want to make Jesus the Lord of my life. Would you just lift your hand up high right now? I just want to agree with you and celebrate your decision this morning. Anybody saying, Pastor, I want to get right with God. I want to make Jesus the Lord of my life. Just lift your hand up high. Okay, thank you. I see a few hands up. That's awesome. Thank you for making that decision today. And let's pray with them, okay? And I'm going to invite all of us just to pray this prayer out loud. Follow after me, okay? Just pray this with me. Say, Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God. You are the promised Messiah. You came and lived a life without sin and willingly gave your life for my sin that I could be forgiven. I could be born again. And I could spend eternity with you in heaven. You rose again from from the grave promising that all who believe in you will also live forever. So today, I place my faith in you as Lord and Savior. Forgive me of all my sins and fill me with your love. Fill me with your spirit so I have the power to live this new life in you. Thank you. I love you. In your name I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jesus, for saving us. Thank you, Lord, for dying for us. Lord, you you said of yourself that you are the Alpha and Omega. You are the, in Hebrew, you are the Aleph Tav. You are the Word at the beginning. Through you, all things were created. By you, all things were created. For you, all things are created. And in you, all things hold together. You are the Word of God. You are the Word. You came and dwelt among us in the flesh that we could behold your glory. And those who did personally wrote of your glory. They wrote of your life and the miracles and all of your teachings. And today, Lord, we are a people who hunger for your word. We hunger for you. We hunger for your presence to be alive in our hearts. So God, establish in us the discipline and the ability and the hunger to seek you every day to open your your word and to study and to learn and, and to dialogue with you. God, not just to do it, but to experience you, to experience your life and your freedom. Reveal our eyes, open our eyes, Lord, that we might see wonderful things in your in your law. Open our hearts. Bless us, Lord, with the spirit of wisdom and revelation that we can know you better, 
Speak to us, God, as we read your word, as we apply ourselves to knowing you. Lord, open our hearts. Let us have good soil and let our lives be a hundred times uh, the seed that was sown. Let us be fruitful and abundant with your life, your joy, your freedom, and your peace. Lord, I pray a blessing on each one here this morning that just hungers for you. God, that they will be filled. Those who thirst for you, they will be quenched. Lord, that they will grow in their faith and be blessed. And Lord, that their lives will be greatly, uh, will greatly produce fruit and those around them will taste of that fruit because their lives are blessed of you. So now I want to pray the Lord's blessing on you. Now may the Lord bless you, keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. May he give you such a wonderful hunger for his word. And may his word come alive in you. May the spirit of God breathe fresh life into those words. And may you grow in your walk with him this week powerful way in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you.